Yeah, I've come equip equipped today, see? You know, these pants, these, these things, like 10 zillion pockets. I think they were, they were invented for this era where you gotta have a mask and you got a microphone gizzy and all this other stuff that you have to carry around. So I'm like, got things in all my pockets. So it's, before we get started, and we're gonna be at First Peter, I wanna encourage you to um, turn there. And before we get started though, uh, have a request for you from children's ministry folks and Kids Blast is coming up and they still have some volunteer positions to fill yet. So I'm gonna tell you what they are. Back in the foyer, there's a sign up sheet. If you're online, you could just send an email to the church saying you're in. And firstly, they need 10 crew leaders. And I'm told crew leaders is like the easiest deal no prep, you show up, your whole job during the time is to get a small group of kids from one station to the other without losing any, okay? So we need 10 of those, people want to do that, and then need five floaters, and that's just when you show up, if somebody was sick, couldn't make it, you fill in wherever needed, okay? So if you are available during that time, uh, please, let, let's fill this up today, let's get this done for Courtney and the gang, and um, be ready. Fair enough? All right. If you're, a, if you're a note taker, today may be your favorite day, favorite message, because I got a lot of things to share with you, and they're like little things, but I don't have, have fill-in-the-blank things, because I just do horrible with those, but I'm excited about what God has to say to us through uh, Peter, and before we get into that, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you um, that it is a gift to us. And it's also a day that you have set aside for our good, to gather, to be reminded of who you are, to uh, be in connection with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, in communion with you as our Father. So Lord, I um, pray that you would speak to our hearts, living words this day, in Jesus' name, amen. So today is April... What is it? 25th. <laughs> then what? April 25th? 2021. 2021 from what? Huh? From Christ's birth, right? So to, you know, we mark our, our annual cycle by the time when, from the time that Jesus was born. And you know, we just came through Christmas and Easter, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but did you ever step back from this and think, People celebrate those days around the globe, and they've been doing it since that time of Jesus, right? Um, it's amazing the impact Christianity has had on the world. I mean, both, just, just little things, right? You don't get up in the middle of the night, smash your toe on a dresser, and yell, oh, Benjamin Franklin. That was horrible, right? We don't do that, right? You know, or you don't get mad at somebody and say, you know, Einstein condemn you. I'm saying it right, right, right? You know, we just don't do that. So all these influences of Christ on the world are, are huge. Did you know that in the time of Rome, the time we're studying in this letter, um, the word that they used for a cemetery was necropolis. That was the standard. It mean, literally means city of the dead. But after Jesus rose from the dead, actually the Roman culture, right, pagan culture, changed and chose another word for cemetery, coimeterion, which means a sleeping place. I mean, the depth of impact of this one life is amazing. In fact, I brought a book, if those of you who are interested in this. It's called um, How Christianity Changed the World by Alvin Schmidt is the guy's name. And he takes a countercultural approach uh, to the whole thing. And he, he begins asking the question, the study was, well, if Jesus had never lived, what would the world be like? And so he began to take note of all the things that um, Christians did and how they impacted the world. And he's very honest about it. Our re the record has not been spotless. But the good has been almost astounding and mind-boggling in the scope and depth of how Christians have impacted the world over time. And it's true, whether you, whether you believe in the Christian message or Jesus is uh, the Son of God, uh, if you're just honest historically, you have to admit, that this person's life really changed the world. Started in the Western world, but the whole globe as a result. But, as followers of Jesus, um, we tend to lose sight of the greatest impact that he had. 
we tend to lose track of the source of the biggest change that happens in the world. It's not what Jesus did in human events, but it's what he does in human hearts that really make a difference in the world. And so Peter's writing, and we've talked about this, I'm not going to go into a lot, uh, to Christians who are living, he says in the very beginning, in exile, they're on the run, unbelievable pressure to conform to Roman culture, to fit into the values, customs, belief systems, lifestyles, and all that, that kind of stuff. And Peter is saying in this letter, don't do that. I mean, he of all people, right, knows what it is to make bold declarations about Jesus Christ and turn around and then deny him. And he's saying, you don't want to do that with your life. I've been down that road. It's not, it's not uh, the kind of regret that you want to live with. And last week talked about, you know, verse 13. And we're going to start there in verse 13. But uh, verses 3 through 12, Peter spends uh, some time in that one big long sentence saying, here's what God has done. Here's what that means. Here, here, here's the wonder of his grace, his mercy in your lives, the new birth that you have, that you have been saved from your sin, you've been chosen by him, you're shielded in your life by God's power. And he's telling them all these things, and then in verse 13 he says, Therefore, therefore. In other words, if you understand that, if you have, have any uh, connection to that at all, then this. Since that is so, so this should also be so. And basically, it could sum it up to you, he says, we are to be different. We're in this series going viral, you know, and talked about, and, and really we're looking at the characteristics that made the church so contagious in a day and age when it was so opposed. And we talked about living with hope, and last week talked about living with happiness or joy. Today I want to talk with you about living holy lives. And holy is a church word. It's always interesting, you know, we, we throw that about. So in your own mind, what's your definition of holy? I'm not going to ask you, I'm not going to point you out, but, you know, uh, I'll give you the, the basic answer. Literally, the word means set apart. Reserved for a purpose. Okay? In other words, in that first word in verse 13, Peter is saying, you used to think this way, act this way, believe this way, love this way, but as a result of what God has done for you and in you, now it's going to be different. In fact, uh, in the Gospels, the disciples are, you know, with Jesus, and he's talking about this new community he's going to build, and, and, and they were worried. They said, well, how are we going to know who's in, who's, who's not? How are we going to identify those who are true followers? Jesus said this, you'll know them by their fruit. Basically, he said, if you're around them long enough, you'll be able to tell. And in this series going viral, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us in our day, in our age, in our faith, in this time, to learn what it takes to be as contagious in our lives and through our lives and in the world that we live as, it, as they were back in theirs. Because God has appointed us, set us apart, as you, if you will, to be his agents of change in this world. And the early church carried out its mission in a world that was hostile to the name of Jesus, violently so. But their impact and influence spread and spread and spread until it turned the whole thing upside down. You know, I, I have a, a video. I, I got some car videos. I don't know how I ended up going this route, but the, we have, yeah, that first one. This is, this is a traffic in a, in a As you, as you look at that and you think about it, it's, it, it, I wonder how many, great place to be if you do body work, I think, you know. Um, but it, it is one thing in this world when you wreck something like your car, but it is a totally other thing when you wreck your life. And where do you go when that happens? Where do you go because of the pace of life and because you're living the way everyone else lives? You find yourself, you know, uh, as Paul talked about too, when you shipwreck your faith. When you make a mess of things that God has given to you. Well, Peter tries to answer that for us, and I'm going to read uh, the verses and uh, unpack a whole bunch of things out of it. Beginning with verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 1. 
Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. One person once said that a truth cannot change the world until it changes the, pers- the life of the person who carries it. The church cannot change or impact the world God intends until the truth that God has given us transforms our own lives. That's the number one battleground we have of living and walking in faith in this broken world. And, and you know what holy is, right? I mean, all the way back in Genesis 2, after the, after the creation, it says God took a break, and he declared that day a Sabbath day. He made, declared it as holy. He blessed it. Now, here's what happens, and, and here's, I think, one of our challenges in our day. Eventually, what God blessed and said is for your benefit, it, it actually came to mean, you know, this, it's a day you can't have any fun on, right? Uh, you don't work on it, and they define work with all these rules. You can only lift so much, only walk so far, all that kind of stuff. So that day was, had more to do in their minds with restrictions than blessings. And it more, it's felt more as a day that, you know, was like holy day, holy Sabbath, but they viewed it as boring. So to start with, when you hear the word holy, what comes to mind? What's the image that forms in, in your thoughts about something being holy? I think we've got a lot of uh, distortions about that. And I want, I want to cover a few of the distortions before we get into uh, what Scripture says holy is and what it's capable of doing. And the first one is this. We, we sometimes, I, I've got names for these so uh, groups, holy finger pointers, right? Um, it, it's, they, they see themselves as super Christians. And if you want a, kind of a scenario or a connection, go back and read the New Testament. It was like the, the Pharisees, right? They, they, they consider themselves models of faithfulness. We got it, right? But here, here's the way it goes. They set themselves out. In the very beginnings, they wanted to live their lives all the ways that God said they should live them, good or bad, or confused. Is that good or bad? You want to order your life according to what God reveals in his truth and his commandments? Good, okay. Somebody say bad? Yeah. And, and then, then they dug into the scripture. And they learned it. They, they memorized it. They had it down, right? They read the commentaries and all that stuff. Good thing to do? Okay. And then they gave themselves to say, we are going to be 100% obedient as far as we understand what God wants. And that's what's going to order our lives, good or bad. Okay, yeah. Now, then they said, just in case we're missing something, you know, and just to be very, very careful about this, we're going to add some extra rules and laws and parameters good or bad bad yeah yeah got them in trouble then they decided that they would become God's spokespersons towards the rest of God's people good or bad they decided they would be God's defenders and they ended up appointing themselves as holiness police holy finger pointers I mean when you read the gospel it's almost funny right because they follow Jesus around, and they're like, why are your disciples doing that? Why, why do you do that? You're not supposed to do that. You shouldn't be able to do that. Come on. You shouldn't be around those kind of people, right? And they became, as a result of the, their, their understanding of holiness, uh, very critical and judgmental and, and finger pointers. They, they made themselves the standard. Everyone else should be like us. And what happened is the God they thought they were honoring with their holy lives shows up. And they rejected him because he didn't meet their standards. Right? They distorted holiness as this rigid, critical, judgmental um, idea. And uh, it didn't end up very attractive. So the second group, you know, you have the holy finger pointers. You have the holy rock throwers. Uh, These were the guard dogs for God. 
If you want a parallel, they're like angry activists, right? Paul, before Damascus Road, was, was one of these uh, folks, right? Modern-day zealots, casting judgments, but not stopping there, delivering, uh, you know, justice. People get what they deserve, and they were going to make sure that it happened. And so whatever the, the, the cultural issue was or the sin issue of the day, they met it head-on with anger and spite and violence when needed to. They were divisive. They were destructive. destructive. And in that, they forgot. The scripture says your enemy is not flesh and blood. And the weapons we use to fight God's holy war in this world are not the weapons this world uses. And the real problem with holy rock throwers is they didn't get John 3.16 at all. That this holy God loved this broken world enough to do whatever he could to save it, not destroy it. And why do we go after it those ways and, and condemn it and throw rocks at it uh, and call that holy? The Lord isn't in the business of wiping out his enemies or tearing them down in this world. He came to save it. He tells us as his disciples, here's some of the marks of a holy life. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Now the day will come when the hammer of judgment will fall, where the sword of truth will devour but the hand that wields it is his, not ours. The time that comes is also his. Meanwhile, we are called to live holy lives in a dark world so as many people as possible would be attracted to the kingdom of God. We are set apart, we are holy, to put on display the beauty of the life of God himself. Instead of seeing people as lost and in bondage and darkness, and needing to be won over, we see bad people as bad and needing to be destroyed or wiped out. Those are the holy rock throwers. And then the third one is holy huddlers. Did I say that okay? Hud, that's two Ds, huddlers. It's hard to say. And, and the idea behind this, if you're a really holy, then the best representation, representation of that is you're pretty much isolated. You're kind of this reflective loner, does a lot of writing in journals, but very little interaction with the people around you. Set apart in this mindset means we are better than them, so we need to stay away from them. Those unbelieving, unholy, pagan, sinner people. And we make this mistake of where, where the scriptures say we're, we're not to be friends with the world. It, we, th we think that or equate that with we're not to relate as friends to the people of this world. In Matthew 9, you have a great example of this. Jesus goes to this party, right? And it gives a description of the people. They were there, then they weren't the religious, you know, top shelf kind of folks. And the, and the religious people on the outside said, what's he doing hanging out with people like that? If he was really holy, he would have nothing to do with them. Rather, he would insulate himself and isolate himself and huddle up with other people who are just like us and let the rest of the world go wherever it goes. But in 1 Peter 2.12, Peter says this, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits. The last play, way we get, um, there's other ways, but the last one I have for you where we get, misunderstand the whole idea of holiness is what I call holy wonders. W-O-N-D-E-R-S. And this is, this is something for our day and age I think we really need to take note of. Because what that means, holy wonders, we confuse giftedness with holiness. Giftedness is not holiness. We confuse passion or talent with spiritual maturity. And so sometimes you, you'll, you'll hear some musicians, and they are so talented, and the words and lyrics and, and how they present it move your hearts, and you get tears in your eyes, and you think, oh, they are so anointed. They are holy people. Or you see leaders who can build incredible organizations who are growing growth charts up and to the right, and you say, oh, they are, those leaders are so godly. Or you, you hear someone who communicates, right, and they engage your minds and stir your thoughts and make you think, and you say, God is really moving. That's a holy man. That's a holy woman. Uh, and, and here's what, that's not, I mean, we can't confuse those. It, it's like modern day Samson's, right? They got a lot of ability, 
And they could do incredible things, but their godly list level was like zero. You see, holiness is essential to rightly handle God's giftedness and talents, but it's not the same as that. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul warns, he says, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to do amazing things. He's going to work miracles. He's going to heal people. He's going to do all that kind of stuff. And people are going to go, oh, man, that's a holy person. But he says, don't be deceived by that. When you see spiritual power, don't assume you're in the presence of holiness. Maturity in faith, which is holiness, is about being different, being changed into the likeness of God, is always measured by holiness of life, not in power of performance. Never measure the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives or someone else's lives on terms of what a person can or cannot do, but rather on the kind of person they are. That's what it means to be holy. So those are all fake holiness, okay, that we need to be aware of. So what is holiness? Well, I'm going to give you an illustration. You know, when our kids were little, I, it was cookies, I'm pretty sure, if I remember this right. But, we, you know, the desserts were out on the table and like, hey, can we have one, can we have one? No, 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 you can, not until after dinner, all that kind of stuff. We had, we had those kind of rules. No, we want one now. No, you have to wait. And so this battle erupted, right? Where they said, well, that one's mine, and that one's mine. Did you, any, anybody else's kids ever do that? They're like laying claim on it, right? And they're all like, like claiming it, and they want the biggest one and all that kind of stuff. So one of my children picked up one of the cookies and licked it. <laughs> right? <laughs> and from that moment on, that cookie was set apart. <laughs> it, it was holy. It was reserved for his use, right? But, I mean, that's a silly illustration, but that's what it means to be holy. It's when the God of the universe comes up and marks you and says, you are mine. You are set apart for my purposes. You belong to God. And if you want, to, if you want another uh, synonym for holy, it's purposed. You've been purposed by God, for God. Now, understand this, right? Because I'm going to talk about how that looks in a minute. But before how it looks, we've got to understand the, the first uh, part of this, verses 3 through 12. If you've been forgiven of your sins by the blood of Christ, if you have been received uh, new birth by the mercy of God, if you have had the Spirit in, inside of you, um, you, are, you are guarded, you are holy. And that's why faith is so precious, as Peter writes here. Then that's why he can say, you're a holy nation. You are a holy people. You're a holy priesthood. You are marked by God. And, and just to point this out, you know, you read the New Testament letters, and, and Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth. And Corinth was an incredibly immoral um, city, the culture of it. And, and he writes to a church where there's incest going on. Everybody knows about it. And they're like, well, that's all right. You know, we're just open-minded here, you know. And, well, we're, not, we're non-judgmental and all that kind of stuff. They're suing each other in legal courts. They're having church potlucks. And nobody's sharing anything with those who didn't have much to bring. And the very first sentence Paul writes in this letter, he says, to the holy ones in Corinth. He's just saying, this is who you are. If your life is in Christ, if you've been new, made new through new birth, you are declared by God holy. You are purposed. You are set apart. You see, what the call of Scripture and, and the importance uh, of God's work in using us in his mission in the world and, and the direction of the Holy Spirit is so that we begin and learn how to live like what Christ has already made us to be. Our faith, Peter writes, is precious, but our faith is meant to have a therefore. As Paul writes to the Philippians, we are meant to stand out like shining stars in the darkness of a broken world. Now, the Greek word for holy is hagios. Um, and this will be a good study. I mean, I did spend a lot of time on this, but I don't have time to get into it. But that very word, hagios, is translated as holy, it is the word that is translate, translated saints. It is the same root for the word that is translated consecrated. It is the same word that is translated sanctified. So if you look back at verse um, 2 of chapter 1, he says, speaking of us, who have been chosen, okay, according to the full knowledge of God the Father, 
through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ. You can, you can translate, through the making holy work of the Spirit of God. That's the Spirit's purpose in this, to make us holy, to shape our lives so they fit the new identity that God has given us in our new lives. And so, holiness, here, here's some aspects. This is what I said, if you're a note taker, this is a good day for you. I'm just going to put several characteristics of holiness real quick. Holiness, the difference, remember holy is different? The difference is thorough. It's not like holy on Sundays or holy for a few hours. It is start to finish. It flows out of our character. So it's meant to be thorough. In 1 Thessalonians 5, this is where it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. In other words, make you holy, you know, top to bottom, inside out. Your whole spirit, soul, body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So holiness is, is, the difference is meant to be thorough. The difference is meant to be identifiable. It has a specific direction. Again, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, what I just read, here's what the work of the Spirit is going to look like in your life. You More and more, you're going to live your life in obedience to Jesus. That's the identifying mark. That's the substance of how we live holy lives. And in, in the third thing, holiness, that difference is observable. If you go to chapter 2, verse 1, he says, rid yourselves of all the malice, deceit. Now, I mean, people don't have to guess if you're living a holy life. It's visible. It's observable. It's noticeable. All right? Why does this matter? Holy living, set apart from by God for his purpose, being purpose is God's intention. It's our calling and privilege. It's the Spirit's intent and purpose, but also it is the world's great need. You know, the world's broken. We know that. And if we're not careful, we can pick up some of those fake senses of what it means to be holy criticize, throw stones, isolate, and all those kind of stuff. But we have to realize that God's change agent in the world is by placing everywhere holy people in it. Our lives are meant to window the wonder of who God is. You know, I don't know if anybody read this, but I think it was last week they're doing a remodel at the Uffizi uh, Gallery in Florence, Italy. And in the re renovation process, two construction workers happened to accidentally discover that underneath all this old plaster were two old priceless, the, the article said, lost Renaissance frescoes. Two members of the, of the de' Medici family. And, and so, you know, that's what holiness is called, this therefore is meant to be, to chip away from us, to take away from our lives the things that mar the image of God in our lives. So that who he is and the beauty of who he is and the beauty of life in Jesus can be seen identifiable, observable in our lives as his people. So here's a great question in light of this text. And make it personal, right? Don't be, don't be the uh, holy Pharisee person. Is my behavior, when people are around me and they see how I act and how I live and how I interact and how I lead, is it a bridge or barrier to others finding their way to Jesus? Is my character, my relational patterns and dynamics, are they a window to the beauty of Jesus and the life he offers, or is it a reflection of the broken world, which is all too common? It's why it matters. So that our lives are a bridge so people are attracted towards the God that we worship because they've seen how he can change and transform our lives. That holiness is meant to be a thing of beauty in this world. Another reason why it matters is, is holy, living a holy life gives us confidence that our faith is real. I mean, does your faith have a therefore? Is there I used to be, but now, hey, it's not the same anymore. Is there a difference? That's what it means to be holy. You know, there, there are three, th I, I saw this sign and I couldn't resist. There are three things that always tell the truth. You got that picture? Nope. You have it? Yeah, there you go. Three things always tell the truth. Small kids, drunk people, and yoga pants. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I would add to that, <laughs> Scripture and the consistent pattern of how people live. In Deuteronomy 29, all the way back then, there's this warning that God gives to his, to his people. He says, beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, I mean, this idea of being purposed by God, being called, being his holy people, being his holy nation. He says, when they hear the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. Did you hear that? He's saying, be careful with that. Our faith is meant to have a therefore. We are meant and called, and if the Spirit's at work in us all, to make us different in our lives in this world. Before Christians were identified as Christians, they were first called people of the way. And what that meant is when people got around, hey, if you're around them long enough, you'll be able to tell because they lived their lives the way Jesus lived his life. In 2 Peter 1.10, Peter writes this, after talking about all these changes, you know, that, that are built upon each other, and he says, you know, if these things are in you and, and growing, then he says, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. In other words, one of the aspects of holiness, when we pursue it and when God brings it about more and more in our lives, it gives us confidence that our faith is real. Another thing that um, holiness does in our lives, it gives credibility in our witness to the world. You, you can um, spend some time with this. In fact, I put it in the questions because it, to me it just kind of is, is interesting to think about this verse in Hebrews 12, 14. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, our immediate reaction to that probably, how many of you have heard that and said, oh, I'm done? You know? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not, you know, so I guess I'm not going to see him, right? You know, what's, what's plan B, right? But I, I'm not sure that's what he's writing about in that passage. I think what he's just writing, or at least in part of what he's saying, is when God's holy people don't live holy lives, nobody's attracted to God. We are the window to who he is. Our holy lives open up the possibility for people to see what God is like. I mean, and the therefore is critical. Imagine in Isaiah chapter 6, you, you remember where that when uh, Isaiah goes up in the temple and the temple is full of the Lord's glory and the uh, seraphim are around there and they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty, right? Remember, you know the passage? Yes? Sure? I'm just trying to, are you here, okay? Yeah. And, and so remember that. And, and then um, Isaiah says, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm done, I'm undone, he says. And God, you know, sends one of the angels, and they take a coal out of the holy fire and sear his lips, right? And then he's like, okay, send me. Now, imagine that story rewritten. And after God sears his lips and says, I'm making your mouth pure, I'm, I'm, I'm making it holy, I'm setting it apart for me, then Isaiah ripped off on a bleep, 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 bleep. Something wrong with that, isn't there? Our faith is meant to have a therefore. And when that happens, it gives credibility in our witness to the world. Holiness, is the third thing, holiness is, is what makes us usable, what makes our faith attractive. Again, in 2 Peter 1, verse 8, Peter says this, If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we are living holy lives before a watching world, God is able to use that. It draws people in. It makes the life of following Jesus attractive to those who are not. Because then we're able to say to them, you know, because they're interested, what God did for me, he can do for you. What God is doing in me, he can do in you. Don't you want to be a part of this? So those are some of the reasons why. So how, how, do, we, how do we live holy lives? Well, it's not instant. We are instantly made holy by God, you know, as far as our position in front of him. We are, we are set apart. 
from the moment we receive new birth, but we are called to develop into that. And that doesn't happen instantly, it doesn't happen easily, but it is possible, and I would uh, encourage you to consider, it is also necessary if we are going to fulfill our mission in the world. Holiness is not easy. Here's my, here's my second video of, of, of traffic, and this is in China. Jesus says, if you want to get stuck, if you want to stay away from the holy calling God has for you, just stay in line with everyone else. But he says, there is a pathway that leads to life. He says, it's narrow. Few find it. It's different, but it's life. You see, Holiness is possible, but it's not easy. It's going to set you at odds with the culture around you. It's going to put you out of step with the world around you. It's going to put you apart from the way everyone else does it, the way they talk, the way they you know, act out in relationships, the way they think, the things they value. And we should not be shocked or surprised. When the world chases after immorality, when it applauds profanity, when it normalizes perversion, we shouldn't be shocked at its dis readiness to be dishonest, to act in anger, violence, and judgmental. But we cannot, if we are holy people, afford to fit into that. And to not do so, you're going to have to fight for that. No one drifts into a holy life. It's costly, it takes intention, requires effort, and you will face opposition. Second Timothy, Paul writes, anyone who wants to live a godly life is going to be persecuted. You're going to face challenges. But it is possible. You know, I don't know who said this, but I wrote it down and I've used it before, but the lives of God's holy people are never at the mercy of their circumstances. That's why I love our mission here, you know, take your next step towards God. Because your life may be going this way. Maybe you're in that traffic jam. You're living, I mean, people, observers, there's not much difference between the way you live, the way everyone else lives, the way you talk, and all that kind of stuff, right? And you're headed that direction. But when God calls you and sets you apart, he says, oh, you need to, you know, I'm going to lead you in a new direction. And then, you know, you turn and you start taking steps in that direction. And over time, you know, things begin to change in your life. We are not controlled by our circumstances when it comes to the kind of people God has made us to be. Some of you probably heard, have heard of Viktor Frankl. He was an Austrian uh, psychiatrist, a Jewish man. Uh, when the Nazis invaded, they took away his freedom, his business. Uh, uh, and then they shipped him off to Auschwitz. Uh, and he writes about the horrors of, of life in the camp. And he, he noticed that there were joyful, committed Jewish people that he knew prior that were committing suicide in that environment. There are kind, gentle people who had become violent and cruel in that environment. And in his, in his uh, book that he's most noted for, is Man's Search for Meaning, he writes this, every day, every hour, offered the opportunity to make a decision. A decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of your very self, your inner freedom, which determined whether or not you would become the plaything of circumstance, renouncing freedom and dignity to become molded into the form of the typical inmate. Woe to him who saw no more sense in his life, no aim, no purpose, and therefore no point in carrying on. He was soon lost. The typical reply with such a man rejecting, rejected all encouraging argument was, I have nothing to expect from life anymore. What sort of answer can one give to that? What was really needed was a fundamental change in attitude toward life. We had to learn ourselves, and furthermore, we had to teach the despairing men that it did not really matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. 
We need to stop asking about the meaning of life and instead to think of ourselves as those who are being questioned by life daily and hourly. Our answer must consist not in talk and meditation, but in right action and right conduct. And then he writes this, everything can be taken from a person but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Peter writes this, you're a son or daughter of God, your Lord is holy. Be holy as he is holy in all that you do. It's possible and it matters. And now that's kind of a, a radical position in place. But even in that, you know, he realized what mattered. That we are not subject to our circumstances in living God-honoring lives. We decide that one way or the other. And uh, that, that decision, that challenge can come up in normal everyday life. Uh, I saw this. Uh, it's a um, Tafoya, Michelle Tafoya. She works for the sidelines for the NFL back when they used to have games uh, and for ESPN. And she posted this Twitter post. Do we have that? I don't have it. So do you have it? Yeah. It's so exciting. My son turned 14 and now he knows everything. Everything. I don't have to tell him anything anymore because he already knows. In fact, he knows more than I do and more than his dad does. We couldn't be more thrilled. What a joyous time. <laughs> you get to choose how you deal with the challenges of life. And Peter's saying, choose to be holy. Choose to be different. Here's some things that will help you do that. I told you I got lists today, right? First of all, you're not going to live a holy life very consistently or very long or very well if you don't have the right people around you. Peter, in writing this letter, says multiple times, I'm writing to encourage, to encourage you. I'm writing you so you don't get off track. I'm writing so you don't forget. And so if you want to live a holy life, one of the first things you need to look at and question is, who do you have around you? Are they pushing you further and further into living a holy, different life to make God look beautiful in this world? Or are they pulling you or dragging you in a direction opposite that? Second thing, you have to have the right foundation inside of you. And this is a verse you can just land. I could have just read this verse and said, we're done. In chapter 3, verse 15, Peter writes this. Sanctify Jesus as Lord in your heart. It's the same word. Make Jesus holy in your heart. Set him apart. He's the one that tells you how to live. He's the one who shows you how to respond. He's the one who set, sets your values and your direction and your responses. Sanctify Jesus, Lord, in your heart. Thirdly, you know, get the right path in front of you. In chapter, in 2 Peter, and remember uh, a couple weeks ago I talked about perspective. Peter writes in uh, chapter 3, verse 11, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, he's talking about fire that's going to come, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Don't lose sight of the path that you're on. You know, that day is coming. And because it's coming and because you know that and you know you're going to stand face to face with Jesus, what kind of people ought we to be? Live holy and godly lives. So Peter's in prison when he writes this letter. And Nero's on the throne, he's, he's the emperor of Rome, and, you know, we've talked about the circumstances and how horrific they were and the challenges of that. But P Peter is, is essentially saying, you know what, Nero and the powers of be, they can light your world on fire, they can feed your family to beasts, they can take away your jobs, they can blame you for things that you had nothing to do with, they can turn public opinion against you, they can slander you, lie about you, destroy your homes, you know, d uh, destroy your businesses. Um, let him, you know, have all that, but don't let him take away your hope and don't let him deter you from living holy lives in a sin-broken world. Be holy in all that you do. Now, the team's going to come up. we got a song, and then I'm going to close up after that. But as they're coming, another help, I think, if you want to live this kind of life is, is because holy means different. If you're going to live a different life, you have to make different decisions. If you're going to make different decisions, I think you have to start asking different questions to those decisions. Questions like, how is this going to impact eternity? 
if I take that job, if I get that degree, if I make this decision, how's it going to impact my, my spiritual walk with Jesus? How's it going to impact and influence the people around me? How does this impact God's reputation? That's what it means. We are to be living image bearers, reflections. And then another easy one, is this decision I'm about to make in obedience to the truth that God has revealed? Just as he is holy, so be holy in all you do. We are called, privileged to be different.